Welcome to Crappy Reviews. I'm Chris. And I'm Rob. What's up, everybody? We're happy you're joining us for our early episodes of Crappy Reviews. Before we get started, we'd love to hear your feedback about the show. Do you have a topic you think we should talk about or just general ideas to make the show better? Let us know in the comments and reviews. We want to get better and earn your subscription. Today, we're taking a break from measuring the trees around town to talk about From Season 2, Episode 7, Belly of the Beast. So, Chris, diving into the biggest point of this episode right off the bat, we've got the autopsy of Mr. Smiley inside the clinic. All everybody there, we got Boyd, Christy, Kenny, Marielle, they're there, they're there the whole time. And Kenny immediately is very against it. Yeah, Kenny's against it, and Kenny's, Kenny needs to man up a little bit here. That's that's my opinion. Quick and easy. He needs to man up. Yeah, I think he was making a very emotional decision, but in the grand scheme of things, the logic behind trying to find out what's going on really made more sense to go ahead and do the autopsy. And once they get inside is where we really learn immediately almost nothing. We see that it's completely dried up. It's shriveled up. And Christy is not having it. She's not a fan of what they found because she was expecting to find blood and maybe find some kind of solution with the worms. Yeah, what we did find out was that Christy made the comment that it was human. So either she's saying that she's it, it looks human and it could have been, or she's saying that it is. I'm not really sure which way the show is taking it, if it was like this, they're telling me this was human or it was human-esque, human-like. But the point is that it does give more credence to the idea that these were once Fromville residents or, you know, possible humans from some other area that are now becoming monsters, whether or not that leads into what's happening to the current members of the town or, or not. I don't know. But the idea that they said that leads a little bit of credence to the fact that these are humanoid and they aren't just robots or ra- random monsters that, that are walking around town. Yeah. And to that point, when Christy starts to have her breakdown in that moment, she does manage to break the gallbladder which does give us some kind of fluid. A little something. A little something. Liquid hey. gold. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't call it that, but Boyd did say, bile's not nothing. Bile's not nothing. It's going to be my new phrase for the week. Bile's not nothing. My wife bile's will love nothing. it. I'm sure she's going to love every second of it. The other thing we learn during this whole part of the episode is that Marielle is going through withdrawal. And this is also the first time that that gets communicated to someone outside of their relationship. When Christy tells Boyd and Kenny, I don't necessarily believe that that's going to cause any ripple effects in the near future, potentially down the road. I think something could come of that, but she's just suffering through that right now. And that's just something that Christy's more dealing with than anything else. I think on top of things. Yeah. I I think that storyline had the potential to go somewhere. Maybe it does. Maybe it does. And I think a lot of us jumped on the bandwagon pretty quick that her drug addiction was going to cause some sort of strife or a potential death or a problem or whatever. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think the only thing this is, could take us to is one, it's just a distraction for Christy and causes a little bit of, you know, like what we saw in this current episode, a little bit of confusion and some guilt, or it could lead us to uh, possibly some sort of visions or almost like an LSD like effect where you could see other things that are in Frumville based on the fact that she's getting high off off something. So it could go that way, but I think it's more likely option A, where it's just like kind of a, a really mini subplot just to give their story a little bit more meat on the bone. But I don't think it goes any further than that. Yeah, I think I would totally agree with you there, especially for this season. I know we have a lot more going on coming up between now and the end of the season, I think for it to become a major plot point. The other thing that I know you talked about offline to me that you wanted to kind of bring up was we didn't get an answer to what happens to the monsters when they're exposed to sunlight. We because, as you said, Mr. Smiley was already dead when the sun right. came up. So we so, don't really know. They they go underground for a reason. I mean, they, they could stay on top. They obviously don't. And we didn't. I mean, maybe he wasn't quite as dried out before, and then the sun did that. We don't really know what happened to his insides, but we didn't get a definitive answer. I need a live monster caught in the sun to see if it like catches fire or melts or does something, or if it just doesn't. It, it could just very well be what happened is what happened. That's fine, but we'll see. Right. 
And I will say, if we have time at the end of today's episode and I can go into my, my theory, there will be some tie in there that might be able to answer that question a little bit. Not saying my theory is right, but it could be a possible solution for it. Okay. So I know I got my theory today. Okay. We had, we had Chris's theory last time. I'm going to go completely different direction. So in this episode, another big thing we learn, obviously as a follow up from the end of the previous episode is that Fatima, that if anyone was listening last episode and we're screaming at your speaker saying it's Fatima, not Fatima, Fatima, finds out that she is pregnant to Christie's best guess and is a little scared of telling Ellis, but does tell Donna. And in that interaction with Donna lets her know that before all of this had happened, she was told she couldn't have children. So that's obviously a very different, but big turning point a little bit in the show, because most of what we learned from the show so far is very negative, right? It's all fears coming out and everything that's happening to the people kind of the way Donna has explained has just been crap on top of crap. But this is, as she says, kind of a miracle, which in her mind is the opposite of a nightmare. So this is, while not a, I, I'll say we might not have a lot to add right this moment because we're just learning about it. Um, I do think it's a very key point moving forward though, as this is one of the big positive things that we've seen come out of the town. Supposedly positive, yeah. It, we, I think it does give a good dichotomy to the consistent fear and phobia trend that's happening in the episodes. It's always something negative. It's always fear. It's always bad. And this could potentially be a little bit of light. With that said, it could also not be. So to your point, we'll have to wait and see. I think it definitely could go either way. I, I'm, I feel like it might go a little bit more negative than we think. And obviously, we're super curious to know what happens, but we'll have to wait for next week at least to talk a little more about it. For sure. Another big storyline we start kind of have working on the side now is that Jim and Randall have started to team up. I'll say maybe a little bit to Randall's chagrin, but Jim believes that the drone that Randall has could potentially get the antenna high enough to try and work the radio again, which didn't work so great the first time, obviously, that they almost took out half a colony house. Well, I mean, it didn't but, work. But was it a good thing? I mean, it worked. We don't know. We don't it know, worked. I guess. I mean, he got feedback and, and some was on the other end. So it worked. We'll see. I do have a little bit of question as an actual drone user, how much this thing can actually lift. But I'm excited to kind of see what they do with it. And I think to your earlier point about Randall, I think everything that Randall comes across is to Randall's chagrin because he's never very happy about anything ever. <laughs> Correct. He was just so excited to get to his nephew's birthday that everything else now is just terrible. Apparently, apparently that's the case. Another big one that's going on across town in the bar as Jade has set up shop in the bar to make, I believe what he said was liquor that doesn't taste like stomach acid. That's what he um, said. That, that would be an improvement. Uh, so he's set up in there and that's when Tabitha comes to him to ask why when he found her screaming in the woods, he didn't react surprised, confused. It just seemed normal to him, which led to Jade explaining how Jim had found him the same way weeks before. One main thing that I think that this brings us is something you touched on last episode, Chris, that you had mentioned they need to have a town meeting. They need to have a come to Jesus moment where everybody just starts spilling their guts. Now, we didn't get that, but I right. do think that this could potentially be a door for that to start coming through. I think we're moving in the right direction. I mean, as someone who wanted a lot more communication, and I know I'm not the only person, this is a pretty consistent topic for anyone reviewing or watching or talking about from, that they wanted more communication. I think that we're definitely getting what we want. It appeased me. I'm happy with it. I see it moving forward. And I think that bringing Jade into the loop, because he's such an outspoken guy and he's not afraid to just say whatever he wants. He'll definitely kind of lead the charge. Jim's ready to make make some moves. So I think a Jim and Jade team uh, with a little bit of Randall in there just to add some spice will definitely get that communication out and they'll start dragging it out of people. And people will probably be a little more comfortable saying something because some of these guys are uh, already, you know, screaming it from the rooftop. So I'm really, really excited about people actually talking to each other. I definitely agree, especially when one of them isn't Victor, who we know knows <laughs> things. We we know he knows things, but he's just not giving it up. 
You know, you know hold on. In Victor's so defense, oh, okay. Victor has seen some things, man. Like he has seen some things. I don't disagree, but to your point, if people are going to start giving information here, he's the one who's got the golden goose. And uh, at least for Jade's sanity, someone has come to him with more information because now he knows someone else has seen the symbol. So I agree. that's a big deal for him. I think I was starting to get the vibe that Jade was starting to give up. I did like his character change a little bit, though. He seemed a little less jade in the bar. He's kind of accepted a little bit more what's happening, and he's kind of taken a little more of a toned-down approach. Some of the news that, that the Tabitha gave him about Thomas and stuff, he kind of reacted like a regular person and not quite so jadish that he always acts very brash and whatever. So I like that kind of character turn. I think it'd be a cool twist if he kind of became the bartender and a little more of the person people talk to. I think it'd be a neat a neat character story arc for him where he became more of that guy and kind of took like a town lead role and not just on his own. But either way, he's a fun character one way or the other. Yes. He also has provided us with the, the biggest burning question in all of from right now is that how he's able, how he's able to have such a big, thick, full beard, but his chest is just completely shaven. I don't understand. It's, it's just a weird it's a weird choice or just something weird going on and that it's might be impressive. weirder than the because I gotta tell you I don't think they're getting new razors in I don't think whatever it is that was my thought razors that's, in the woods like sheep so this guy a, here that's a dangerous shaving tactic for that is a big knife that's all I'm know, saying whoa daddy that's that's so that's scary in a in a more topical probably uh more interesting question to everyone else uh we have the ending of the episode which obviously Gives us almost a little more mystery, but something to really hold on to going into the next week is we see Elgin talking to Julie, describing what happened up at the clinic, obviously saying, hey, don't tell anyone, don't tell your parents. This is something that Boyd wanted to keep on the hush, but explains it to her and describes the feeling how he always feels like he's very close to remembering something, can't quite put his finger on it, Uh, but Julie gives him the, uh, let's say method of how to calm down where she goes at the tub and tries to relax. So Elgin tries it out to which we see Elgin experience the music box, which is not the first time we've seen someone experience the music box in this episode. Marielle did see it when she had her nightmare going through withdrawal, but we do see him see the music box and immediately is attacked by a shriveled woman shoving him under the water. (laughs) Yeah, that was, First of all, it was a super good ending for the episode. Um, I really liked it. I know some people are going to get annoyed because another mystery was introduced and we didn't get all the answers yet, but I thought it was super fun. The The Elgin story is interesting because it happened early in the episode when they first saw Mr. Smiley outside. He had like a weird vibe. Boy kind of questioned him. He brought that up and talked to, to Julie about it uh, and gave us a little more. He's done this with, uh, Fatima at the lake. He, he, you know, progressively through, through his appearances, he's had this, like, I can't really put my finger on it thing. So I don't, I don't know what his story is. And I don't want to speculate and waste too much time on the podcast, but I do know at the very end of the episode, we have some sort of banshee like creature. She has this weird voice and the look of a banshee like creature, which is a Celtic or Irish entity that usually means someone is going to die that's close to you or you're close to death. That's what these creatures mean in that particular folklore. I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm saying what it resembles. And in this show, they're obviously pulling this from some sort of source material. The main question is, that was my drum roll. Is it Fatima or is it not? Because she's got a similar cloak and a similar hair and a similar look. But she doesn't have the necklace and at the very top of the the cloak or whatever it is she's wearing, there's more orange than she has the one that you see earlier in the episode. So it's not an exact copy, but it's damn close. I will say that's one thing that I had not thought about. I do want to add one thing that I've seen as a theory that I think is completely out in left field and isn't true because it ties into this, is that there is a theory that Elgin is actually the time-traveling son of Fatima and Ellis, which I hope that's, I, I think that one's a little too out in left field for me, even for a show like this. I just wanted to throw that out there that I personally, I want to, I don't think I want to, I don't think I want to give that any time. And I really hope that's not the case because I don't like it. 
<laughs> the sad part is the only thing that leads me to think that it could be true is that I've made a case to you offline that there was a part of me that thought Elgin could be Boyd's long lost son somehow or something like yeah, that. You did say that. Are related. You did say that and that could be true. And there was a lot of theories floating around after the Martin episode that Boyd time traveled and that's why the castle or whatever he was in looked kind of new with Martin. And then when he got out, it was there, but like in ruins did he time travel and, and maybe he did, maybe he didn't. So they've so kind of time like travel could definitely be, could definitely be involved, but j- that theory alone, I think I just kind of want to personally, yeah, I want to squash it. it. Well, true. Yeah. I think, I think from a, from a crappy review standpoint, we're going to mark that one off as not true and hope that we're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Cause we're either going to be really wrong or, really or just happy it, or just happy. It didn't work out. Okay. Ran through the episode. Those were our key points. Chris, out of 10, what did we think? Let's start there. I'll give the episode. um, I'm going to do all my rankings in just the From universe. I'm not going to compare it to every other show because every other show isn't From. I mean, this is a pretty unique show. I'm going to give it a, I'll give it a seven and a half. A a seven, seven and a half. I think it was a strong episode. We got some information. The characters are moving in the right direction. I'm seeing a good buildup for the end of the season. I'm seeing us go somewhere um, where we got to mid season and then we just kind of put our foot on the gas. So I'll give it a seven, seven and a half. I enjoyed it. And they gave me some, some good information and and a new mystery at the end. And I'm, I'm excited again for every Sunday. I was excited before, but I'm really excited after the last two episodes. That's really crazy to me because usually we can never agree on ratings out of 10. Whenever we talk about anything, I'm giving it a seven and a half as well. I think for kind of the same reasons, I really like having something that's driving us forward now, other than questions. Yeah. There's, there's a goal. Uh, I wrote it down in my notes as we want to find out what happens when we inject another monster with smiley's Biley. smiley's Biley. That's what I'm calling it. I I know you called it, (laughs) you know, liquid Liquid gold gold. (laughs) to me, smiley's Biley. So we have, something we're looking forward to more than just the answers to the questions to me, which I think was a big step from the show that I really enjoyed. I do think having more of that information start to come together as well, like with Jade and Tabitha and giving Jim and Randall something to do. There's a lot of forward momentum now and it's, it's making it really exciting for me. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. We even have some of the stuff too with Christopher and Victor and Jade's story, but the car is deep in the parking lot and, what happened with the notebook and all those kind of things. So I I think from that point when we did the parking lot tour with Victor and Jade all the way till right now, we've gotten a lot of steps forward. And like, and like you said, I'm I'm excited about the trajectory the show's going on. I think it's, it's moving in the right direction. It's, it's definitely a hell of a lot better than it was the first five episodes, but that's not to say it was bad. I know there's story building ones, but I think we're all excited to like go. Now we're kind of on the downhill of the roller coaster. And that's the the fun part. We the build up was there, but now we're we're heading down and we're all screaming and I'm pretty excited about it. Totally agree. That being said, theories. I want to touch a little bit on some theories that mm, we think is gonna happen here in the future. Juicy, juicy theories. I have a real quick one that I know you looked into and you've already mentioned a little bit, and that's the woman holding Elgin down might have been a banshee. And I want I just want to make sure everybody knows how confident you were. <laughs> I don't want to say I was super confident in it. I, <clears throat> that, so I'll tell you what, that theory of her being a banshee isn't really part of this. But what it does, what I am going to say is, I thought that maybe her uh, shrieking or the noise she was making might have been more than just a shrieky noise. So I took the episode and I grabbed the audio and I put it into Audacity And I reversed it and I inverted it and I flipped it and I slowed it down. Hashtag not a sponsor. Feel free. Oh, oh yeah. Feel free to be. But I I did all the the mixing that I that I could with my limited experience. And I'm gonna tell you what I found. Nothing. Absolutely (laughs) nothing. (laughs) I was really bummed out. I thought I was gonna break the lock and get all the information, and I didn't. So anyone wants to try, I've already done it. Frontwards, backwards, left, right, up, down. It's it's the same sound. If you play the record in reverse, it's not going to say John is dead. It's not. It is not. 
as disappointing Her, as that may be. So yeah, we, we put the legwork in for you and it, and it didn't, it didn't pay off. So don't save, we saved some time people. That's what we're trying to say. Chris saved you some time. So I think I want to go through here a little bit because we got to hear Chris's main theory about what's happening in Fromville, from land. I know we've got a couple names for it across the internets and, uh, Obviously, his his main theory was the Norse mythology and kind of the the gods and, and pieces there. I have a theory, not I won't say personally, but it's my favorite theory. It's the one that to this point I believe has been the most plausible. It's lined up with so much of what's happened in the show already that I couldn't ignore it and it's been stuck in my head now. So this actually, most of this, parts of it have kind of been my own, but most of this came from Reddit user Taryn Matharu on the From Reddit page. And they believe that all of this is actually based off of the Beothuk or Beothuk people of Newfoundland in Canada, which is a very specific place. So there was a, an indigenous people in Newfoundland and Canada that were wiped out and attacked by settlers by the Cabot expedition, who were the first people to actually find North America. There is a legend that a woman was tried as a witch by these travelers coming over to find this new land. And one of the expeditions actually took her son away as they were leaving. And one of the Cabot, the first explorer, had left these tarot cards and she had played, it was, the, it was the only card game at that point. And she had experimented with these tarot cards and actually went through and made a deal with these Beatuk gods to bring her son back by playing this game. And the legend is, is that all of these expeditions were swallowed up and, and taken in by the land. And the theory being this land in Newfoundland, which is actually where they film a lot of the show, is the location of Fromville, from land. And I'll go real quick here. All of the characters are representing tarot cards. So you've got specific examples where uh, Jim would be the hanging man, because when you see Tabitha's vision in the lighthouse, he's hanging upside down by his leg, which is the exact picture on the card. You see the fool, which would be Boyd, because he's always carrying things in knapsacks, even when he's got a handle on the bag and it matches the card. And the point being, there is this game going on between the witch and the demon or god of Beatuk. And there's a, whole, there's a whole piece of a game with four players and two teams. And that's why it's resetting. Is my, and this is kind of a piece that I, I, I've kind of added on this in my mind, where it's resetting at all of these times throughout the years because the game is ending and restarting. So I've done the bare minimum of scratching the surface on this theory, but it links all back to this witch's deal and game with the demons and devil of this area. And that's why we're seeing this resetting. And it all started because of her losing her son on the expedition, wanting to bring him back. And I believe here's my, here's my big crescendo. I believe it wasn't Christopher who sold everyone out like we've talked about. I believe it was Victor's mother because she made a deal with them to protect her son the same way the witch had done when the legend and the game first started. So Victor hid. But Christopher, ready, escaped and found the lighthouse, which is the safe place in the area and has been living in the lighthouse and is who talked to Jim on the radio. It's a whole thing, man. I was in way over my head. I've been going. I don't... I don't want to, I feel like I could just talk for like 10 more minutes. So I'll stop there, but I won't stop there. I got one other thing I want to add. Sorry about that. The reason I say there could be an answer for why nothing happened to the monsters in the sun is that to your point, the birds always seem to be around watching things in a lot of folklore. Crows carry the souls of the dead. The crows are the souls of the dead that possess the bodies of the monsters at night. So that's why you never see the crows at night, but you own, and you never see the monsters during the day. So that is, they're almost one entity. And that's why they know their names when they show up and they say, hey, come outside, you'll, you'll feel better. They're able to watch people during the day as the crows. 
And then the worms are on the other team. I'll put it that way. Cause it's all described as this ongoing game. You've got the crows and the monsters and then the worms. And there's more, I feel like I can't describe it in enough, in enough detail uh, at this given time. Maybe, maybe we'll have to come back and do a strictly theory explanation for both of us and, and go into deeper dives. But one last piece I'm going to add, because this is the one thing, the whole thing I'm reading, I go, I love this. It makes sense. But obviously, you know, there's a lot of theories. I've heard so many different theories about the show. Kids, when they were walking towards Tabitha, kept saying the word. Uh, let me make sure I say this right. Uh, and Kui. The only place that I've been able to find that word in any language is in the Bantuk language, or Beituk language, Beituk, and it's the word for tree. So everything being said, I, it seems kind of on the, on the fringe. Like it's a little flimsy, but I like it. It makes a lot of sense. There aren't many plot holes or things that I can find. And then when I heard that, I was like, that is a little on the nose. So credit to Taryn Matharu on Reddit. You really got the ball rolling in my head on this. Like I said, there's a lot I kind of left out, but that's the gist of my working and favorite theory about the show now. Completely different angle from yours. Oh, and there's a sea monster involved that looks like a jellyfish. That's a, that's a little throw in there too. So man, I was, I'll tell you guys, I was losing my mind over this. I thought it was ingenious and all credit because I would have never been able to piece that together, but it is my favorite. It's the one I'm going with right now. So after hearing it, I have read this theory in the briefest of, uh, of instances. I was on Reddit and I read a little bit of it, not in that detail. Cause what, if you guys haven't seen it yet, it is an extremely long Reddit post. It is a, it is a short novel. This guy put a lot of effort into it and I got right to the witch and it's a game and there's tarot cards and the hanging man. And I was like, I got to go to work. And I, and I stopped reading it and Rob <laughs> really, really went deeper into it, but it is a really well-researched post. And I'm really, I'm angry now that you, cause we don't tell each other the theories prior to the show. We talk about a lot of stuff, but we don't bring up the theories. We want to kind of be a little surprised when we talk about it. And the, the toy the kids play with that they found inside the cave and that the, Jenga, the, the Jenga, <laughs> my the Jenga, Jenga game. game is also has a, has an interesting name and it also has some sort of very specific location that it was uh, developed in. And it's probably something you should look into Rob to, to try to strengthen your theory or the theory that you've co-signed on. Uh, Cause it, it might, it might strengthen it depending on where that game uh you know, uh, is, was developed because it might, it might also tie into that same culture. I, I think when I first said it to you, you screamed Canada or something like that. So yeah, Newfoundland is up in Canada. So yeah. And that's why I'm thinking you screamed it and I'm like, all right, maybe that game was part of it and it all kind of ties in. Uh, and, and that also, that's a good theory because it brings in the Ethan and the whole idea of like this quest in this game. It's not exact, but it definitely is in the same line of we're all part of some other bigger picture game. Something bigger is playing with us as pawns. Kind of plays into Jim's theory in the show as well, that we're kind of being controlled in this way and pushed in these directions. And how Randall's saying there's just some parties in the town that might be purposely there to stir the pot. And that is where I want to kind of end it and wrap up the podcast. I want to ask all the all the listeners to put in the comments or the reviews or just at least think about it who if any are some of the you know the the negative forces or the people that are you know kind of part of the plan that Jim might be talking about that Randall's referring to. Do we have any do we have these people in the town? Do you think Randall's it himself and he's just trying to stir in the pot? Do you think that Tilly, who's my personal favorite, because if you haven't known, I do not like Tilly. Uh, no, we haven't had a chance to talk about Tilly yet because oh boy, the second I, episode and Tilly has not been in these last boy, two episodes. Boy, do I not like Tilly. I think Tilly's a mole. But is there other people in the town that are part of this that are pushing it along? Fatima, definitely a good case for this. I'm curious to what everyone else's thoughts are on this. I'm sure you guys will have some really interesting picks for whatever your your own personal reasons are. 
I think yeah, that's I it have, for me. I have one that I, I'll, I'll save to myself for the next episode, but I think is one that people probably won't agree with very much that I know I've told you. So uh, yeah, we can, we can answer either, but Hey, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you're wrong because this is from, and, and they could turn and twist us in a million different directions. All right. Well, with that yeah. said, we appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. Yeah. Feel follow us on subscribe. Twitter. Yep. Follow us on Twitter. We're crappy underscore reviews. And we're, we're really excited. If you guys have any comments or feedback or anything at all, let us know. And we're, we're trying to make sure we cater the shows to give good information and make it as fun as possible, but also fit into everyone's, everyone's lifestyles, bite-sized morsels of, of from on a, on a daily basis or whatever show we're talking about that week. Yep. Well, thank you guys for making it this far, listening to us. And I'm Rob. I'm Chris. And enjoy your shows. 